Well, hello there. Greetings. It is Deacon Ray. We are looking at Job 35 today, and we're going to uh, take a, a continued look at uh, Elihu and uh, the uh, conversation that he's been having with uh, Job's three friends and with Job himself, too. And uh, we're going to take a, a good look at this and see what we can learn uh, from this conversation. Uh, one of the things I did, I looked up the word Elihu, and uh, it's a Hebrew origin, of course. Well, we know that, right? Uh, but it means he is my God or my God is he. And so that is what we see of Elihu, right? His name meaning that he worships the one true God. And so he comes today as that representative, too. A few things that we've discovered about uh, uh, Elihu, and that is that, one, he uh, is not mentioned uh, as one of the friends uh, when they first come up there. They have the three that are listed, but his name remains silent throughout until we find him speaking. And at the end, uh, an, an amazing thing, too, is that we find Elihu uh, not incorporated into the conversation that God has with Job and the three friends, that uh, he remains kind of out of sight on uh, on both ends of that, right at the beginning and at the end. But then he steps into a, a very powerful role here when he uh, is speaking to first the three friends and then to uh, uh, Job. So, But it's nice to have you along today. Karen, thank you, and Sally, glad to have you. Lorelai, Diane, and Edward, and again, all the others that will join us either live now or later on as your schedule has allowed. Uh, we appreciate you stopping by and taking time to spend with us as we look at God's Word. And it's been a long journey as we've uh, tackled the entire book of Job, and we'll continue on through that. And uh, so today, again, like I say, Job 35, we'll be using the ESV version of the Bible. And when I looked at uh, Elihu, and especially in the first time he speaks, it talks about he burned with anger. And it got me uh, thinking about a, a time in the life of Jesus and the disciples when he had cleansed the temple, and uh, it said that his zeal, uh, you know, for God's temple burned inside of him, you know, talking about Jesus. And I kind of wonder if that's not a little bit of the zeal that we see in Elihu. In fact, that actually comes from the uh, Psalm 69.9, which says this, for zeal, for zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. And uh, I think we get a sense of Elihu, that that's what's going on with him. He sat there, you know, biting his tongue. And maybe he would have spoke up sooner. We wouldn't have as many chapters to read um, as he, uh, you know, sets the record straight in, in a wonderful way. And in fact, we're going to find out that Elihu is the last one to speak before uh, God comes into the thing. And so some people see him as a bridge between the uh, arguments and the discussions that uh, Job and his friends have been having, uh, which would use the uh, the common understanding of pain and suffering, you know, the quid pro quo, the idea that what you do is what you get. Uh, but not all suffering can be uh, summed up in that. It's not like every uh, person who gets cancer uh, is getting cancer because of something they did or didn't do in their life, right? There's a lot of reasons why cancer can attack us. Um, and uh, we want to make sure when we're speaking to people that have had it or have it uh, that we don't start pointing the finger or blame at them. Well, of course, if you hadn't been smoking or if you'd have done this or you'd done that, uh, we don't always know the reason why suffering comes into a person's life. Uh, but what we want to do is maybe what Elihu does, and that's redirect uh, the thinking, uh, taking away the common accepted reasons for pain and suffering and maybe look beyond that into something that... Uh, uh, it speaks of God's majesty and his power and his wisdom. So, Betty Ann, good to have you, and Corinne and Ruth Ann, glad to have you along as well. Uh, as I look at this, and I jumped right in and started going because there's so much that I wanted to cover, I uh, should start with a word of prayer, though, right? So if you'd join me. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for this fellowship in which we gather, a fellowship that you've caused to happen, uh, that we may use it for these very reasons, to share the love of Christ with those around us to expand upon the Word of God and to grow in a deeper understanding of it. And we pray that you would bless that time to this end, and that as we go uh, and uh, as we study it, that we will continue to grow into the image of Christ, that others will see him living in and through us. And all of these things to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And again, welcome. Glad to have you along. Uh, the reading from thirty-five, uh, Job 35 is relatively short, uh, and we're just going to kind of briefly read through it, and then I've got some things that I'd like to say about it and share with you. So if you have your Bibles handy or your electronic device, 
um, and you can follow along and certainly do that again using the uh, uh, ESV version. And uh, Janelle again and Toddy, good to have you. And David, I'm going to say hi to you as well. And Donna, good to have you along as well. Uh, so it starts out uh, chapter 35. And Elu El Elihu answered and said, Do you think this to be just? Do you say it is my right before God that you ask, What advantage have I? How am I better off? Than if I had not, than if I had sinned, I will answer you and your friends with you. Look at the heavens and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than you. If you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness concerns a man like yourself, and your righteousness a son of man. Because of the multitude of oppressions, people cry out. They call for help because of the arm of the mighty. But none says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night, who teaches us more than the beast of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the heavens? There they cry out, but he does not answer. Because of the pride of evil men, surely God does not hear an empty cry, nor does the Almighty regard it. How much less when you say that you do not see him that the case is before him and you are waiting for him. And now because his anger does not punish and he does not take much note of transgression, Job opens his mouth in empty talk. He multiplies words without knowledge. <clears throat> and again, uh, that the concept there, right, that uh, people that go through suffering uh, can oftentimes say a lot of things and they can see a lot of fault and blame in God. And for them, we, we want to... Uh, you know, stand by them, and we want to be there, but we don't want to add to their misery, um, and we do want to, at some point, as Elihu is doing here, uh, readjust their thinking, get them to reframe away from the world's view of suffering and get it into the framework that God gives us, that God works through suffering to accomplish great things. And again, as I've said before, all we have to do is take a look at the cross to see what God does with great pain and suffering has never been experienced before, not even by Job. Uh, the suffering that Jesus went through was so, um, so powerful and so overwhelming that only God himself could have withstood it. And that's why Jesus came, right, taking on human flesh, being both God and man at the same time. And so in your suffering, a lot of times it may not even be about you. Uh, it might be about other people in your life, that God is um, getting your attention uh, and uh, working with you and through you, uh, and also to reach those around you. Uh, as I've stood in the unemployment line before, I've had opportunity for conversation with people that I would have never, ever have seen before. And uh, to have a conversation that talked about the love of Christ. Uh, you know, would I rather have been employed? Absolutely. But if God was using me in that time of unemployment to, to speak to people, what a blessing that was, too. And that's just one example. And I'm sure that everybody here has a good example of some of the things that are in, their, in your life, right, that you've done and gone through that gave you opportunity, opportunity to speak of God's great love and to do that. Um, I want to go back kind of for a second here with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the way that Elihu starts his uh, conversation, you know, back in, I think it's, what, uh, 32. And um, it, there's a movie called Woodlawn. And if you've ever seen it, it's a very powerful movie. It's a movie based on some civil unrest and uh, rioting that was going on in the South, especially in, um, what was it, uh, anyway, uh, Woodlawn, yeah. Uh, i trying to think, Birmingham, Alabama. And so as he's going through... Um, as we go through the movie and we see that tumultuous times, there's a character who comes in whose name is Hank, and he's played by Sean Astin, and he is a uh, representative of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and uh, he goes into Woodlawn High School, and he wants to speak to the team uh, and about the rioting and the things that are going on, and he wants to proclaim Christ there. Of course, it's a public high school, um, and so he says to the coach uh, who's going away into a meeting, he says, do I get an introduction? And uh, the coach says, no. So he goes uh, into the gym. They get all these uh, students uh, uh, mixed, uh, you know, the blacks on one side, whites on the other, and just kind of separated. And uh, Hank uh, is waiting for to go up and give his uh, speech. And then uh, the, the assistant coach tries to introduce him. So Hank gets up and bangs a bat against the thing and gets their attention. It quiets right down right away. And uh, he says, thank you, I've got it from here. 
And I kind of use that as an example of what I see in Elihu. You know, all the other talks been going on back and forth amongst the four of them. And now Elihu gets a chance to stand up and to get his attention. He speaks with uh, zeal, he speaks with fervor, and uh, he wants to get uh, to redirect their thinking and getting it onto um, the, the real issue in the suffering of Job. And that's God's majesty. It's God's sovereignty and it's God's wisdom and his power. These are great, great, wonderful blessings that, uh, that he brings into the conversation. And it's also good for you and for me to, to take a look at those things when we're suffering, to recognize that, <clears throat> as, as it says in uh, uh, Job uh, 35 there, uh, and I kind of, I like the way he says this. Um, he says, that you, do you say it's my right before God that you ask what advantage have I? How am I better off than if I had sinned? Um, and then he says, I will answer you and your friends. And, you know, some people think that. Well, what's the sense of living a life that reflects the love of Christ? Why try to follow God's rules and laws in this life? Not because we want to obtain eternal life, but because we have it. I want to make sure we're clear on that. But, but how do we, uh, sometimes we think, well, what's the use? I mean, look at all these people that don't even worship God, who don't even uh, acknowledge his existence. And look at how he's blessing them. What, what have I gained by my doing this? And the real question is, what haven't you gained? You've gained eternal life, not by what you've done, but by what God has done for you through Jesus Christ. And so the things that we do are never done or should never be done out of compul you know, compulsion that we have to do it. It should be because we want to do it. We want to serve God. We want to live in his grace and mercy, no matter what our life is about. That's why Paul writes, you know, rejoice always. I'll say it again, rejoice always, right? And we're to give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't mean we give thanks for the circumstances, but in them we give thanks to God because he loves us. He has redeemed us. He has given us eternal life. And then as Elihu is going on, he says, If you've sinned, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? In other words, we can't, overpower God. We can't harm God. Uh, God died for us uh, in Jesus Christ, right, as he died on the cross for our sins, but that's because he chose to. He could have stayed aloof from us. He could have said, hey, it's your mess, deal with it, and uh, uh, I'll never see you again, but that's not who our God is. He's a God of love and compassion, and all the things that he does in our life is to bring us to him. Yes, even the things that happened to Job were to draw Job closer to him, not to drive him further away. And that's why he sends a guy like Elihu, right, to, to be that bridge between the world's view of it and then God's view of it, because Elihu becomes that bridge, right, that, that starts to pave the way for God to come in, uh, as he does uh, in chapter 38 and, and to the end of there, as God proclaims exactly what Elihu is saying, right, that these uh, things that Job's complaining about, um, God has them. And he will bring something wonderful out of them, as, which we see at the end of the book. And I don't want to get too far ahead, but if you've read Job before, you know that there's a, a huge amount of blessing that God pours out upon Job, not because Job deserves it, but because God is kind and merciful and gracious to him. And uh, I'll tell you what, there's so much more that we could say about this, but I've kind of reached near the 15-minute the limit. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and pray that you'll continue to uh, join us in our study here on uh, Job. Uh, we'll certainly be back tomorrow uh, with a continuation as we start getting closer and closer to the time when God himself will show up and then he will uh, clarify the record for Job and for you and for me. Whatever suffering we're going through, God is with us, he loves us, and he cares for us. And may you live in his grace and mercy. And again, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, Carrie, thank you for being here, and Shane again, and Donna. And thank you for all. And if you'd like to hit that share button, uh, it won't bite you, I promise. And if it does, I'll bring over a Band-Aid. You just let me know, and uh, we'll, we'll get this message out that others can know again of the great love that God has for them. And one more thing that I will say is Elihu uh, kind of prefigures Christ in, in the way of his zeal and his, uh, his desire to get the message uh, out uh, and to the correct message out to uh, the four friends there and to you and me as uh, 
as we learn uh, also about God's majesty and his, uh, his love and his compassion and all of these things. And so you and I can also be a bridge between others and Jesus as we carry his love with us too. May God grant us peace and grace and mercy, and we will see you next time around. You have a wonderful, wonderful day.